all categories that we have as people are socially constructed. And the only reason why any category exists is because it usually does something valuable for us. So right. it might even be the case. Now, I would have to think particularly between like transracial and transgender because there's other questions that are like tangential to it. But it might actually be the case that, yeah, we wouldn't care about a particular thing until some people start killing themselves over it. That that would make it so mm. that it is this issue becomes so important to human happiness that now we're going to recognize it. Now we are going to recognize it. But it sounds like that's a bad answer, but I think that that's a perfectly valid answer. The reason why it sounds silly is because it seems like all these other categories are like very real and rooted in science and blah, 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 blah. But I think in reality, basically every category we have, we just kind of like make this because it helps us understand the world better. And if it is the case that transracial people kill themselves, then well, fine, maybe they get their own recognition so that they don't do it. Right, right. Okay, so that's, see, I find that to be a way more interesting argument than, than a lot of the other ones I've heard. Mm -hmm. And I would love to get into this more because I actually have way more questions for you. I, I don't actually know what we're supposed to talk about here. <clears throat> wow, hello, hello. Oh, now I'm getting feedback. Well, turn me off your speakers or whatever. What do you mean? There we go. Sorry, boomer moment there. How's it going? Am I on stream or no? Um, yep, everybody can hear you right now. Oh, okay, sweet. I told you, chat. Your, your YouTube chat were all calling me out saying I was being a pussy for not coming on. <laughs> well, good job. Um, I have your camera here, but the last time I had a blonde conservative girl on, she literally got me banned for four days, so I don't trust any of you mother <laughs> now, so give me like 90 days for my ban timer to reset, and maybe, maybe I'll change okay. my mind on that. Uh, you know what? My lighting's bad right now. If you want to put me on camera, you can. I swear I'm not uh, hiding Hunter Biden nudes, but completely understand uh, <laughs> if you don't want. Gotcha. Okay, so, wow. First, Xander Hall. Now, Hunter Avalon, who's next? Who's on the docket? Oh, I know. I know. Um, you know, I don't know why I keep saying yes to these debates. I just wasted like two weeks of my life going through a bunch of really bad data. <laughs> so I, I've, every time I do one of these debates, though, all of the debate bros fear just start messaging me and tweeting me, me next, me next. Um, I guess I think it's been a while since there's been a lot of conservatives in the debate sphere. Am I wrong about that? When I left for a year, were there still a lot of blood sports going on? Um, I think there's like, there's like, there's three different things that happened. So one, any like very toxic internet community, um, believe it or not, most people actually don't enjoy that. There are very, very, very few people wow. online that like perpetually fighting. I like <laughs> fighting a lot um, and I don't take it personally, but most people like get ultra ass mad and then those communities will eat themselves alive. So I don't I don't remember how deep yeah. we were into the YouTube news, but do you remember like Tonka Saw and Andy Worski and JF, Gary I Eppie? vaguely recall them like trying to do IRL streaming and pulling a gun out or something. I, I guess a ton of those people went a little too hard IRL. Cause, cause you know, you're constantly chasing the next what's going to be super exciting and crazy on your stream. Mm -hmm. And eventually you'll chase that into oblivion. Exactly. Until you're yeah. in jail. So yeah, those people have done that. Um, so that's one thing that happens. Um, a second thing that has happened is that um, at least as far as Twitch goes, I'm kind of the one that built like the political community on Twitch. So everybody here is extremely left leaning. And if you're a conservative, you get bullied out immediately. So there are no <laughs> conservatives that live stream on this platform. Um, and then in terms of like YouTube and everything, um, depending on what type of conservative you are, you have a much higher likelihood of getting banned immediately. Um, if you espouse like more radical right leaning views versus left leaning views. So if I get on YouTube right now and I start talking about how like, I don't know if the Holocaust is real, um, I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble, but I can talk all day about how, you know, like the Holodomor wasn't real and the Uyghur stuff isn't real and I'll probably be safer to do that. Um, just as oh, like a political. that's great. Group. Yeah. And then. That's good. That's healthy. Yeah. And then the third thing <laughs> is that I think a lot of larger content creators have kind of realized that like debate stuff is just not really worth it. Like why would you risk making yourself look kind of bad or dumb in a scenario when you don't need to. It's not like your main content, like why even risk it? So a lot of the larger conservative people just don't do debate or even a lot of the larger left-leaning people will just not do debate because it's just easier not to. You just kind of like talk to your own audience. The online audiences are getting way, way, way bigger. You don't need that spectacle of online debate anymore. You can just do like normal podcasts or shows and people will watch you, so. Yeah, that's what I'm beginning to realize. I'm doing these debates and I'm not really, uh, I'm not streaming on my end because I genuinely don't think my audience are that interested in like a debate on my book or debate uh, with, Hunt. maybe they are, maybe I should. But um, yeah, I've just kind of noticed no matter what you do or how you do, 
your community or his community are going to think you won. So Hunter's audience are all like 100% he won, absolutely destroyed her. People that support me, 100% she won, absolutely destroyed him. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I'm not sure the debate stuff is making much ground here. Uh, I, I mean, I would disagree, actually. I think it does quite mm -hmm. a bit. Um, it's just, it's hard to see. Um, the rule, I've talked about this for years, but I always say the 40-40-20 the thing. There's like 40% of people are so dug in on either side, and they're going to be the loudest, and they're, they're never moving positions, or it's going to take years to do it. But there's like some group of people in the middle that can be swayed. And depending on how much you like submerge yourself in these um, communities, you can see people kind of moving one way or another. You know, like um, if, if I right. wanna see if I, if I felt like I did good in a conversation with like a left-leaning or a right-leaning person, like if I start reading through their social media afterwards, let's say that I debate, um, I'll say a, a lefty. Let's say that I debate like a really far left-leaning person and I wanna see if I did good or not. If I go onto their communities and all of them are spamming, they're like, oh my God, like Destiny got destroyed, he wasn't ready for what he's doing, blah, 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 you know? Then it's like, okay. Maybe I didn't really have like the greatest showing here, even if my community also said I did great. But um, I recently had a conversation with uh, Richard Wolf. When I go through a lot of the comments for that, a lot of people are saying things like, this wasn't responsible platforming, like Destiny and Richard Wolf shouldn't be on the same platform. It's not fair or right that he had to talk to him like that. It's like, okay, I think I did a lot better here because you can see like the kind of like the more anger or whatever. And it applies to like conservative and uh, left-leaning audiences as well. Um, so can like- Can you explain you know. this responsible platforming thing to me? I genuinely, like I get the meme of it, like, oh, don't put them on on your show, but I, like I, I genuinely, I don't understand. Is the idea that you don't want your audience to potentially agree with some of their ideas so you can only have them on your show if you're going to absolutely destroy them? Is that the idea? <clears throat> Um, so you already believe in responsible platforming, believe it or not. Um, most people do. Okay. It's basically, you don't want an incredibly harmful idea platformed without it being adequately, adequately challenged. So like an idea of how a conservative might talk about responsible platforming is a conservative might say, I am very uncomfortable with all of this like LGBT sexual stuff being brought up in my, you know, children's classrooms because I think they're going to be like, uh, like propagandized and inundated with this kind of like ideology okay. and it's going to affect them, right? And it's more of the same, less whether we're talking about children or adults, it's more like the same type of concept. If I bring somebody on and they talk about how cool Nazism is and stuff and I don't really have a counter argument to anything they're saying, I'm basically just giving them like a free platform to talk about how cool Nazism is for an hour. Okay, okay. I guess that makes a bit more sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, how did, what did you think of the debate? Personally, looking back on it, oh my goodness, I'm, even I'm cringing, like I can be honest when something wasn't that fun to watch. It was just kind of us sitting there debunking each other, reading studies online. Obviously, neither of us uh, are ec complete experts at the data. Mm -hmm. um, oh man. I also I, did the hunter, hunter, hunter thing, which you're so right on. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah and he did some of the Lawrence stuff. It's just our, our oh. ways of being condescending. I mean, like, I can't watch my own debates for the same reason. It's really hard. Like, it's very, very rare that I ever, like, re... Like, I'm never rewatching. like, oh, God, this was such a cool debate moment. Like, that's... Yeah, it's really hard to... At least for me, it's hard <laughs> to listen to myself. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, like, um, I, th I think I said it on stream. I think for stuff like this... Um, I mean, like rhetorically, it seems like obviously I'm sure you feel it that there are parts. There's a lot of parts in here where I think you have an edge. I think that if Hunter is going to be bringing up like studies like this, um, I, I think I mentioned this on stream. I don't know how much you're listening to. Uh, there's always going to be like three or four huge studies that people are bringing up over and over again in anything, any particular room, whether you're arguing some economic concept, some sociological concept or whatever. There's always going to be like the three or four big studies. Um, and it's probably important to be pretty familiar with those. Uh, if you want to have like a, a real debate where you're actually like going back and forth on this, it's probably good for both sides to know what research the other side is going to bring beforehand because then you can get into a more fleshed out argument than well we're all going to sit here in silence for about 60 seconds while we read the abstracts of each other's studies to see if we can nitpick a methodological error that we can use to attack <laughs> yeah, the other person yeah exactly yeah um yeah but, but i mean like that would obviously be like the preferred method um yeah i think in um, terms in your... oh god yeah, people in your chat were asking if I if I was arguing in good faith and Lauren's bad faith, bad faith. Like I can genuinely say, if I went and dove into this subject, and I dove into it with the honest perspective, I, I have to consider maybe Hunter is right about this. If I dove in and every single study, all the major studies, the biggest studies, uh, all of the ones with, they all had great methodology and they were all saying like, this will prevent kids from 
uh, committing suicide. This improves their life. This has very few adverse effects to it. If that was what all the studies were saying with all the best research, I'd be like, well, I guess, you know, I guess that's just what the reality is. And I can't deny that. But, you know, like I said, my, my issue is it doesn't seem like there's very good research. There needs to be more research done. The best as research improves said improved research, which with larger sample sizes is not showing this conclusion mm -hmm. that it is, um, you know, th that uh, hormonally and physically transitioning with medicine it is making people happier, as the Brandstrom and Pachanka study showed. Is this, so you're speaking very specifically to... about transitions starting in childhood or overall transitions? Oh, well, well, the thing is, when you put a kid on hormone blockers, the mm -hmm. idea is that you want them to be able to physically transition, right? And if we're finding out that physically transitioning isn't actually helping people decrease their suicide rates or overall quality of life, then why would we even start that process? So my understanding is that let me back that up and make a stronger statement. So hormone blockers are given because um, puberty is that represents that like that stage in your sexual dimorphism where stuff changes that can never unchange, right? Like up yeah. until they start to go through puberty, boys and girls are like roughly the same. If you remember like um, it, like uh, physiologically, so if you remember like grade school, we'd all go out and play kickball and the boys and the girls could play with each other. And it was like, and actually for a while, the girls have the edge because girls actually start puberty faster. And there's that weird moment in like, is it like third grade where all the girls get really tall and all the boys are really short? And you're like, what the f um, so <laughs> yeah. for a while, like girls and boys are like relatively similar in terms of like sexual characteristics. Like it's not until puberty happens that like the skeletal structure changes, like boys become very masculine, women remain pretty feminine. And then that's where like the big changes. The point of um, puberty blockers is that if you try to transition, especially for trans women, so for biological yeah. men that want to come, if you try to transition after you've gone through a male puberty, that's like really, really, really hard to do. Cause you're like, like I'm like a man now and it's really hard to get away from those changes. So like the idealistic Absolutely. goal of like puberty blockers is like, okay, if you think that you're trans, go on puberty blockers for like a year or two and like try to figure it out because once you've gone through puberty, it's you're not really you're not really going to have an easier time transitioning and then maybe hopefully you make a decision here. And if you do decide to go through puberty as the sex or sign at birth, like you know, at least you're at a year to try it and yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of like the idea. Yeah, right? I, I totally, I totally get the concept. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, what was it? Blair White that did a video with a individual who did the whole hormone blocker thing. It mm -hmm. was a uh, male to female transgender, and you literally could not tell the difference. Like, didn't have broader shoulders. You you wouldn't be able to pick it that this individual was transgender because they didn't go through, um, they didn't go through the masculine or not masculinization rather. They didn't get that massive wave of testosterone. Didn't mm -hmm. go through puberty. And I get that. Like that is for someone who is actually transgender. They're not getting rid of that dysphoria. They grow up and they're absolutely sure for the rest of their life, like this isn't going away. I could see how that looks like the ideal situation. And they'd look back and be like, oh, I wish I did this. This would have fixed so much in my life. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is there are so many people that actually desist. And there's such a large amount of um, data that's, well, you know what, I'm not going to appeal to data anymore because I'm clearly not a data scientist, but there is some data anyways that shows puberty is that point for when people decide. So are we delaying people making this decision? Are we potentially preventing people from making this decision? Because the assumption is if they never go through puberty, maybe they'll never desist because they never got to that deciding point. So they just continue on this mm -hmm. way and they're never certain. And then we just have people going through these massive surgeries living this lifestyle that we know has higher rates of suicide we know has a lot of social problems which is not great it's not ideal some people have to live that we we want to treat them with the utmost respect and love as we can mm -hmm. but for people who don't i i feel like it's just such a that's that's a really big decision to make to say we're going to just delay it and start moving towards the decision to transition them when there is this bigger chance that they will desist. And when we're already seeing data that's showing fully transitioning through medicine isn't really having that much of a positive effect anyways. Well, we gotta be really careful when you say that. When you, when you say fully transitioning through medicine, my understanding is that at this point, for adults that do it, like it's pretty ubiquitous that it's generally a positive result, especially as you get more and more support like socially. If you're an adult and you transition, um, like I think overwhelmingly, or is this something we disagree on? I don't know, man. Um, I'm just saying there is a lot mm -hmm. of data that shows it isn't necessarily the social support that causes or even social 
um, rejection that causes high suicide rates and, and issues in life. There's a lot of data that shows, I think there was a, a report, I've got it in my debunk documents here, <laughs> mm-hmm. that showed the suicide rate amongst transgender people who reported absolutely no social discrimination was still 25%. So we can't make a direct correlation between not sure. being socially accepted and suicide. Kind um, of, yeah. But the, when it to comes be... to the social acceptance, the mm-hmm. biggest aspect of that is actually phys- physical assault. Sure. So like someone punching you, someone beating you up. That is what tends to raise suicide rates the most. And the other things, bullying, that's all very consistent with, um, with cis kids. So there is something inherent to this dysphoric condition that is aside from... Um, you know, affirming someone's gender that causes people to have high suicide rates. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that it's like a, a super multifaceted thing. Um, I would say that when we compare like the suicidality and saying it's 25% even people that with people that seek treatment, we would compare that more with like, well, what is the norm? Uh, or we'd compare that with people that didn't rather than just the norm, right? So I'm sure that mm-hmm. suicidality might still be high with people that have transitioned. That's my understanding. It's going to be high compared to the norm. But the goal is that it wants to be lower uh, than the control group of people that wouldn't have transitioned, right? Um, mm-hmm. So when it comes to the child thing, um, I agree that, like, um, I think that there's a huge issue that uh, people overstate the confidence that we have that these treatments are, like, the best thing to do. Um, a lot of this is still, like, very new, is very experimental. Um, I, so I guess, like, a question. So, like, you mentioned, like, we need to get more data or whatever. Would you be, like, yeah. opposed to having, like, trials or studies of these drugs? Or they're like, okay, well, you know, if you want to opt in to a trial where you go on puberty blockers or whatever, like, this is stuff that we're going to, you know, allow people to do because we want to continue to get more data and research this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's super hard with kids. I'm really against the idea of making kids guinea pigs in general, just because, once again, this is huge, life-changing stuff. We don't, I, I, I think you would at least agree that we don't know all of the effects of mm-hmm. puberty blockers yet. That's um, true, but Lupron, like... Lupron has a very negative effect in adults, so mm-hmm. I think it's safe to assume it would have some negative effects in kids. So I think the idea of doing more research on gender transition in adults, which I'd like to think we both agree, if someone is taking puberty blockers, the uh, that transitioning to appear more like the opposite sex and to be physically more like the opposite sex is the end goal, right? You're mm-hmm. trying to block your puberty so you don't look like either what you were born your, your yeah well tech, you it's born, the goal right? is to give you some time to make that decision but yeah ideally if yeah, you do make that decision so if, yeah if we do more research and we find uh more studies that back up brandstrom and pachankas that says actually it's having no effect so we're spending all of this money we're putting people through all of these medical trials and putting them on medicine that ha- does have risks as all medicines do and mm-hmm. it's having no effect well, I think that's pretty solid that we shouldn't be giving this stuff to kids. So sure. uh, it, once again, if we did more research and it went against Brandstrom and Pachankas as the research got better and we had better control groups and more people were opting in mm-hmm. um, and it was saying, actually, this is really helpful. Uh, I would not be against starting, um, you know, let, let's try now that we're seeing we've got more adult data that's backing this up. OK, let's do a few trials on kids. Let's see how this goes, as much as that still makes me uncomfortable. But right now, not with the data we have. No, 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 no. Sure. So I guess it's it's like a separate conversation that's beyond this conversation in terms of um, whether or not transitioning is effective for um, adults. Um, I, I guess w- one thing that I kind of like take issue with, and I hear this kind of brought up a lot, is mm-hmm. this idea of like uh, we're uncomfortable experimenting on kids. Um, I mean, we, that's kind of the only way that medicine works, though, right? Like that's we kind of have to do that. Yeah, I, I, I get that argument, and I, it, you know, the the idea though. So like, and I know people are going to get mad because this is an anecdote, and mm-hmm. how could I? But like, I have known people who have detransitioned, right? Mm-hmm. And they're like, for the rest of my life, I have breasts, and I actually can't afford to get rid of them, and this causes me huge insecurity issues, and this is like a real. Yeah, this is sure. this is really hard. That, so and that that might be true, but like so I think about there's probably uh, also like you, you've got you've got to consider. on the equal anecdotal side, right? You've got like people that have gone through puberty and then they've spent an immense amount of money trying to transition, but they just they can't. Their puberty was just yeah. way too masculine, and they're never ever ever without like millions of dollars of surgery. They're they're not going to convincingly transition. Um, but there then was you even, have the other way around as well, where you have someone mm-hmm. like Jazz who didn't have enough tissue and they had to go and get tissue from other parts of the body because 
uh, they didn't have enough penile tissue to make a neo-vagina with, mm -hmm. right? And then some people also lose sexual function when they don't go through puberty. So they'll never have an orgasm. Are we really comfortable taking away the experience of an orgasm from a whole group of people for scientific experiment? That's not necessarily the case every time, but that is a definite risk. Sure, and I understand. It. I just have case. to be, I think we have to be really clear because we use these words like scientific experimentation, blah, 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 to make it sound like it's all just like trust in the dark. I mean, a lot of the things that you just said, a lot of these side effects, we already accept for women on birth control, right? Like yeah, loss of yeah. sexual drive, massive changes in appetite, uh, different amounts of water you might retain in your body, um, potentially like serious side effects related to like blood clots or anything down the road. Like yeah. these are all things that we already accept for a lot of it. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure if you take like, some people can have an adverse reaction to like Tylenol, you can have a stroke and die. Um, which but remember, which, it's, it's a risk benefit analysis. Exactly, which I agree. So the whole question yeah. comes mm -hmm. down to, do we have more studies that actually show that there is a benefit to this. And right now, the best study we have, which is that Bram Strompachankis one, is saying, no, there isn't a benefit. And that's the ultimate question. And like I said, if another mm -hmm. study, if the research got better, more refined, we continued it, there were better sample sizes, better control groups, all these things, mm -hmm. and it was continually showing there is a benefit, uh, that's gonna be a very different conversation. Sure. How do you feel about like, I guess like trialing like SSRIs with like teenagers? Like, should that just be all like off limits until we know, and then if you're suicidal or whatever, just you as a kid or like how like or like or even or even like less contentious things like uh prescribing like ritalin or adderall or vivance or like adhd medication you mentioned um, yeah so i'm i'm on vivance right now literally mm -hmm. on vivance this minute as mm -hmm. we speak and yeah. i personally waited until i was out of high school that was really difficult like if you look at the grade difference between mm -hmm. my high school grades and my university grades it's it's nuts mm -hmm. um it was still a it was still a very serious process, like a six month process that I went through. Um, even just to get re-prescribed them as an adult, they had to go and get my files as a child of my mother reporting things about ADHD. So I, I think we've refined the process around that a bit more. But I I'm almost of the opinion that the the risk, as much as it was hard as a kid, I I don't think it was so bad that I waited until university. Um, I don't know. That's that's it's, it is a tough one. Mm -hmm. It is a tough one. And Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend there aren't complexities and I'm not going to pretend I've studied SSRIs. Sure. I, haven't. Mm -hmm. I haven't. It's that's like another area that like, man, if you think transitioning shit is hard, like SSRIs are literally like, I feel, I feel really depressed and I might commit suicide. And sometimes when you take one of these pills, it makes you want to kill yourself even more and you actually do kill yourself. Like yeah. that, the research around that is like really hard. Not to say that they don't work because sometimes they do. Um, but there's also like a lot of research around like ADHD medication. And I'm sure if you did a lot of this homework, you know, that that like if you take these long term, they might present like negatives to your heart. Um, you said that you're on Vyvanse, so I don't know if you do one dose a day or if you break it down into two doses because of the mood swings it can cause or anything like that. Have you dealt with any of that kind of stuff or? Yeah, so I like I've tried to take breaks and not mm -hmm. do it because obviously, I mean, I made it pretty clear in the Hunter conversation that my I, I, if you don't have to take medication, probably don't if you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, but it got to a point where life is really hard to balance with a kid. I don't want to be forgetting my child at daycare, you know? So yeah. I've got to, got to deal with my ADHD. Mm -hmm. I take one dose and I don't take it on weekends to take a break and not mm -hmm. have to. Gotcha. Focus on it. And I'm on a very minimal dose. Yeah. I don't, and yeah. I, so, and I can understand this. So my kid was on Vivance for a while. So my kid has unimaginable ADHD. It's like unreal. Yeah. And um, Did he get that from you? <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I, I, it's funny because I never would have imagined it because I can play video games for so long. I figured, well, if I can concentrate on something, I can't have ADHD. It's hyper focused though. I didn't know about that until my son got diagnosed right. and then I started to research and I was like, oh shit, because I had a lot of behaviors in school. Like I, a teacher had to like fill out my assignment notebook or else I would never do homework. My parents, there was a whole bunch of dumb shit like that. Um, but I, but I guess one of the things that like, one of the things I try to think about as a parent, so when I had to do, I had to make that decision of like, well, how do I feel about like, um, uh, like my kid being on, you know, Vyvanse or other types of ADHD medications because there's long-term risk or whatever. Um, and that's a decision that was like between me, uh, his mother, him to some extent, you know, I have to find out how he feels, and then his doctor. Hmm. And I would be really scared if there were people that tried to take that decision away from me. Like if there was like a, an advocacy group that said, we shouldn't experiment on kids, this is wrong. There's some data that says that it's harmful, which there is. Um, you know, there's some data that says that ADHD is overprescribed, which they're at, or overdiagnosed, which there absolutely is. Um, you know, there's data that shows that it's more diagnosed in boys than girls, which yeah, the, you know, there is that too, right? If somebody had found a way to take that decision away from me as a parent and my kid, I love him to death. I love Nathan, he's awesome. Yeah, of course. But this kid is literally rolling across 
the fucking classroom. Okay. He's like <laughs> between that. classes, he had to crawl through like resistance tunnels in order to actually like get his energy up between class or he just couldn't do it. It would just, it would so bother me if I lost the ability to make that decision as a parent because somebody was like, no, we can't do this to kids. It's wrong. Like we need to wait until like the 9,000 million sample size studies done. There can be no experimentation in the meantime. Cause like, I mean, I'm sure as you figured out by now, like, parenthood is like a giant fucking experimentation you know like none of this shit is solved yeah. you make all the same mistakes your parents did and their parents did or whatever we're all kind of figuring out as we go along you know yeah oh no i i i get that i mm -hmm. didn't even know it wasn't normal when i would stand up in the middle of class and feel like i just need to walk out <laughs> i yeah. can't can't do it anymore mm -hmm. um yeah so that that's obviously a huge thing i will say that it's a bit apples and oranges because what if you were told that you know, your your kid has ADHD, but there's a large chance that they, if once they go through puberty, they won't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. But you can also delay puberty. You know, you can take something that will delay it and then you won't potentially know. Like I, if I knew that there were a chance that I would not have to struggle with ADHD for the rest of my life, I would want to lean more towards, let's get to that quicker. Let's lean towards that solution. And then if that doesn't work, and, you know, maybe a better comparison would be, okay, there's a high chance you are not going to have ADHD for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you find out that that's not accurate, you're going to have a really severe form of ADHD. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, but you can take this drug that will delay it but then you also won't know mm -hmm. it's uh, so it's a very complex. Yeah. Very, yeah. It's very super, it's super issue. duper hard. Yeah. And there's like there's a ton of like yeah and there are there are there's a lot of competing voices in it right now. Um, it is a heavily politicized issue as well. Um, you That's know. a big issue I have mm -hmm. is the politicization of it. I worry that you know we're not getting the the most honest conversations. We're not getting the most honest results. And even you mentioned if there were as someone who came in the way and said, okay, as a parent, you have to or have to not do this treatment. You'd be disturbed. You know there are parents in Canada that right now. If a kid wants to go on hormone blockers or even hormones, the government says you as a parent have to do that. And um, I, I'd like to think I'm think cautious to acknowledge that because I don't know if that's 100% true. Um, a lot of the times these issues okay. get brought up, it's not exactly as they say. Um, like, I'm willing to, because I know there's like some really common case where like the dad won't call the girl or daughter and his daughter and now he's arrested blah 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 but that actually is way more to do with like him violating a restraining order and like a whole bunch of other shit that goes into that so it's not quite as people present it um but i mean like i, I at the end okay, of the well, day you know, yeah, okay let's ahead. just say mm -hmm. let's just say if, it, if that were the case if governments were saying parents have to do this would you be against that just out of curiosity um it's, with the data with the poor data that we have now maybe later yeah it's harder because i because we would um because i'm not ready to do it right now I, I just haven't like actually like gone through these studies i go through abstracts and what other researchers say and that's it so like i'm not in a position yeah. where like like if what you are saying about the data is true then obviously i would probably not be in favor of the government like mandating something like this but if the data was like far more clear um then i probably would be in favor of like having some stronger government mandates on this now i don't know if that drives well with american ideology and freedom but like i f i tend to fall way more to the radical on that i personally think that if your child is obese i think that should count as child abuse literally and i think you could have mm. your kid taken from that but so i'll go way more extreme because you're literally destroying your child's life probably more than having them if you Honest to God, you are killing your child more making them obese as a kid than you are giving them puberty blockers, in my opinion, okay? But like that that's a whole I, other I don't, argument. You're, you're probably not. Actually, it would depend on... Well, let me... Yeah, the, no, the, I, think the, right I think Yeah, I think that <laughs> the number that I saw one time, I don't know if it's true or not, but I believe it because it sounds true, and I, I've tried to refine this, but I think it's like, of all the people that become obese, I think 3% of them will ever return to a normal BMI. And like, anecdotally, like, it seems to be true, like, you see a country... But yeah. that's neither here nor there. I'm just saying that like, if there was something where it's like, this clearly is in the best interest of the child, we already kind of do that a little bit. Like, if you're like in an abusive environment, Environment, the government will take you, blah, blah, blah. But I, I guess it comes down to what would we define as an abusive environment? That's an that's a, a abusive environment. That's a really hard question. Th that is a, a lot of other shit, but um, yeah. Yeah. I also have like, I gotta be honest, and I wish I got into it on the Hunter debate. Maybe when I have more time another day, you can you can educate me, even though it's probably not your job to educate me, as, as people always tell me. Um, I really wanted to get into some of the stupid questions I have about the transgender conversation that I think a lot of people have that just aren't answered um, or aren't talked about often. Like, 
<laughs> why can't you be trans age kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I genuinely want a good explanation around that stuff. Because I, I mean, I, I know on face value, people will be like, oh, that's a that's a Ben Shapiro tier question, Lauren. You're just trying to do a gotcha. No, I actually want a good answer for that. I genuinely yeah. do. The, so th there's like, there's two of them. I, I've heard the trans age one is brought up as a meme. There's another one that's brought up more seriously and it's the trans racialism, right? Um, right. I'm actually, I, I don't think the trans race one is as complicated as the trans age one because the you you have people argue oh you you with transgender individuals you have people that are in men's bodies and they have women's brains and there's this biology stuff and you can socially transition and that mm -hmm. you have people that are 40 years old with the brain of a five-year-old or 10 year old and we mm -hmm. socially transition them to an extent to make life easier for them you also have people where it's like you're an old soul you're a young soul mm -hmm. and they hang out with high, different age groups and even kids that are way smarter than their age that skip a grade, right? Mm -hmm. So why why can't we just say there? You can identify as what age you want. So you no. Know? Um. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Oof. Okay. So, See, I don't think it's that dumb of a question. Well, <laughs> it's not that it's dumb. It's that in some ways it's just it's using verbiage we don't normally. Okay. So for transgender and trans. Um, sexual is kind of like an antiquated term. For, for, for transgender people, the idea that we have, the reason why we say transgender is because it seems like, um, I'll compare it to the race one real quick, it seems like we have some yeah. internal experience of our gender. That seems to be like a thing that we project from our mind. We have an idea of like, we think of ourselves and there's like a gender that we think of with ourselves. It's like part of this internal experience of how we like interpret and deal with the world and have in our minds and everything. It doesn't seem like that's the case for something like race. For people to say, oh, well, transracial. It's like, I don't think that like the mind and the inner workings of like a black person are like di not different than like the minds and inner workings of like a white person. Whereas for like men and women, it does seem like we're wired to some extent in different ways to think about di things in, in, in slightly different ways. And we have like a big like internal feeling of our gender that's like so strong that if it's off, we'll kill ourselves. Um, I, there's like a couple of really famous experiments with like intersex kids where they tried to make them the other thing and they ended up killing, they never could like get into the new sex that they were given after the surgery and it ended up like- Yeah, I've seen that. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, for, the, for the trans age thing, it sounds dumb because we don't use the term trans age, but technically we all actually do believe in the concept of trans age and we actually do act accordingly. Like, for instance, if you have people with like severe forms of mental disabilities that are like in their 20s, 30s, 40s, we actually do treat them as children, like even legally. Like it might be the case that in right. some places you actually take away their autonomy and you assign them a guardian. You don't let yes, them- they say, can't have a mm -hmm. license to drive a giant truck. Exactly. Mind mm -hmm. of it, yeah. Yeah, totally. so to some, and then there are some people that are quote unquote mature for their age and you know, you might even necessarily treat them as such. The reason why like saying we have like trans age is because age very specifically refers refers to like how many rotations around the sun were you born, right? So like that number, it's hard to say like, oh, well I identify as like a 15 year old. Like nobody would say that's because well 15 years like is literally a measurement of time. But you might actually say like, you know, I actually feel like I'm more mature for my age. I like hanging out with older people or whatever. Now that's complicated by the fact that literally every single young person says that. But like you, you actually do to some extent have like this idea of like trans age. It's just harder to say trans age because age is like a specific number that like refers to like a specific unit yeah. of time, right? Well, then there's there's two questions that come from that. The first one is, okay, so we have people that, um, you know, we realize are outliers and have brains that kind of associate with different ages, whether it be up or down, mm -hmm. and we will adjust society for them. But because of those outliers, should we now allow the option to everyone else to be socially treated in different ways. Like you have these people that they, I, I mean, maybe it's a sexual thing, I don't know, but they like to wear diapers and mm -hmm. they like to be treated like they're babies and stuff. So now because we do have like genuine, genuine medical um, and neurobiological outliers, do we allow everyone else to just choose because of the said outliers? <clears throat> and if it is the case that we can say, okay, we can treat someone different, we can give someone a different role in life while still acknowledging they are 40 years old, mm -hmm. uh, but changing everything else, this is what comes down to the difference between sex and gender to me when I think about what the feminists did, feminists did in the 40s to say, okay, they're separate because we can say, okay, you're a male, but if you feel you are more female in your gender and society can treat you that way we can treat you as though you have a feminine role in society maybe even use uh she her pronouns whatever i don't know mm -hmm. but we still all acknowledge that biologically you are a man mm -hmm. just like we would acknowledge the person with the five-year-old brain is still biologically a 40 year old yeah so i mean this like i, I think that yeah. yeah so 
<clears throat> there's a couple of key differences. So a big difference is in my experience, generally people don't kill themselves because they're like, they feel more mature than they are. So like if you're a 17 mm -hmm. year old and all your friends are really immature, it's very rare that like, okay, I have to commit suicide because my friends are so immature and I can't hang out with older people. If that started <laughs> happening in mass, then maybe we would transition like, okay, you're 17, you're very mature for your age and you're at like high risk of suicide. Maybe we throw you right into college, right? Like the kid and smart guy or whatever. I don't know if you've ever seen the show before, but like, uh, like maybe we take you, we just start thinking, that might be a thing. That being said, um, to speak to the broader concept, I actually think that almost everybody would love to do what you're suggesting if it was possible. So to go to something, well, I'll go to the most contentious topic I can think of because it's what I'm known for. We can look at something like the age of consent, right? The idea that yeah. nobody below the age of 18 is responsible enough to engage with sex is silly, much the same that everybody that turns 18 is instantly able to engage with the concept of long-term advocated sex is also silly. Everybody in, that is listening to me right now knows of some 21 year old that definitely is not mature enough to start engaging in sexual intercourse and can decide whether or not they're ready to have a kid. There's lots of f people like that, right? Um, and then much the same that like, I'm sure there are people that, you know, are very mature that are 15, 16, 17 that are probably more capable of weighing these long-term ramifications than some people that are in their like early 20s, right? This is, we all know that this is a possibility. But because society is what it is and we can't like stick something mm. on somebody's head and measure it exactly, we can't really like do this individual adjusted things so we kind of just have to ballpark it at 18 and that's what you do but th but i mean like if we had a way otherwise to know like i mean i'm sure we'd want to right I, there is like I, I think everybody would agree with that right that like okay you know what some other f***ers, you know at a certain age, you need to stop driving. And you know, at a certain age, you shouldn't be allowed to do this. At a certain age, you shouldn't be allowed to do this. And it might not be that exact age, but it's like the type of people that are the way they are. But we, we just don't have a way to know that in every individual, right? Okay, so that, see that's, yeah, that that's, that's an interesting argument. Um, but I don't, so the idea with a lot of people that argue about transgenderism, certainly in the progressive sphere, is that they were always that way. They were born that way. They're actually a woman stuck in a man's body, vice versa, and you can't, you can't question that. And then you're essentially saying, well, the reason we, we transition them and we do all this is because there's suicide rates. We're trying to save them. We're trying to ensure they have the best level of uh, care and health in our society. And I, that all is great. Mm -hmm. But then is their existence only, is the existence of something only validated or valid if someone will commit suicide if they don't get it because just because people aren't committing suicide over not being affirmed by one age or the other why why can't it still exist like is the deciding factor whether someone will kill themselves or not on whether something's real um uh okay let me rephrase this uh a little bit so i can understand what you're saying so um we have two people um one is transracial and the other is transgender mm -hmm. and your argument to me is you're basically saying like, let's say that there were a whole bunch of people that were transracial and they all started to kill themselves because they weren't recognized as the race that they wanted to be. Would you start suddenly recognizing the validity of transracial people? That's kind of like the question you're asking, right? Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think we have to get into like a little bit of philosophy to start to answer that because that gets a little bit more complicated. Um, the, the, the short answer that I would give, um, and this gets like very uh, deep, this is this we have to go like really far if we want to do this like the short answer that i would give is i would basically say all categories that we have as people are socially constructed and the only reason why any category exists is because it usually does something valuable for us so right. it might even be the case now i would have to think particularly between like transracial and transgender because there's other questions that are like tangential to it but it might actually be the case that yeah we wouldn't care about a particular thing until some people start killing themselves over it that that would make it so mm. that it is this issue becomes so important to human happiness that now we're going to recognize it now we are going to recognize it but it sounds like that's a bad answer but i think that that's a perfectly valid answer the reason why it sounds silly is because it seems like all these other categories are like very real and rooted in science and blah 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 blah. but i think in reality basically every category we have we just kind of like make this because it helps us understand the world better and if it is the case of transracial people kill themselves then well fine maybe they get their own recognition so that they don't do it right right okay so that's see i find that to be a way more interesting argument than than a lot of the other ones i've heard mm -hmm. and i would love to get into this more because i actually have way more questions for you mm -hmm. but i do have to go pick up my child yeah i understand my adhd <clears throat> meds are making me 
remember that. Dude, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the, something really, really ultra quick on the end of that for yeah, every absolutely. single like per, um, I always forget the names of these. I should remember this. But for all of like the psychology stuff that we recognize as like disorders or whatever, um, the criteria for these are oftentimes like has a negative impact on your life, um, inhibits your ability to get a job. Like if you were to figure out like, hey, is this person addicted to like masturbation? Right. The questions you would ask would actually be like, are you not able to work a job? Are you not able to have friends? Are you not able to maintain a relationship? And that would actually determine if you have the addiction. So even in psychology, we already kind of like model stuff off of like how bad does it affect your life before we recognize mm. it as a disorder basically um but yeah that's right it, yeah. but okay, okay. um all right <clears throat> be careful. giving me some things to think about we'll chat again another time we got to play a league game right sure yeah remember to hit that like and subscribe and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed booty 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 booty